My name is Stephanie Harris von Wiegen. My name is Ennis Sigler. I'm Casey Kaluni. Hey guys, Eric to here, your worship pastor here at CCV. I have been attending CCV for 20 years. I've been attending CCV with my family for almost 12 years. I've been a Christ Church of the Valley follower since 2003. I actually walked through the doors of this church uh, back in February of 2010. Happy to be having this conversation because I've been having this conversation for longer than any situation has been going on. Really excited to have this conversation and what it means to our community in such a crucial time in, in the life of the church. Hey, thanks for coming. Welcome to our house. Uh, really appreciate you coming over for dinner. Um, back in May of last year, this guy called me, Eric, and I took the call and I went outside. I was sitting on the porch and it was uh, right after George Floyd and um, he said, brother, we got a great relationship. Uh, I gotta be honest with you. Your silence is speaking volumes. And I'm disappointed. And I just, I wanted to talk to you about it. And, uh, and I, I said something about social media. I don't have like a real strategy for social media. You know, I'm not one of those people. Um, but I told him that I was planning on speaking uh, on Sunday, preaching a sermon uh, about this. And so I did, and uh, I thought it went really well. And, uh, you know, I can always count on my wife, Lisa, uh, to, to be a straight shooter. So we're in the car, and I just, you know, uh, how'd it go? And she was like, no, 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 no. She said, essentially, you said, because I had black friends growing up, I'm not a racist. She said, it's not about you. It's about some larger issues. And um, I, I missed it. I missed it last March, April, and May. I missed an opportunity. I failed as a leader. So um, I thought, OK, well, moving forward now, I thought the best way to engage in a conversation is to do what our family does all the time. We get together for family dinner. You bring friends over and you, you talk about it, the good and the bad and the ugly, and, and you're honest with one another. So, so that's why you're here. And uh, so you're having a conversation where you're going to help me. I just thought it would be interesting uh, to have other people in the CCV family hear this conversation, and they can actually join these conversations later on. But uh, so I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. I don't want you to throw me softballs. I want you to be very honest and real. And this is family dinner. So just, you know, you're getting up and moving and we'll take breaks and that sort of thing. But let me go ahead and pray and then we'll jump into it. All right. Uh, God, thank you so much for our time together. We thank you for good friends in Christ. I uh, appreciate their uh, willingness to be uh, very patient with me even uh, as I stumble. And um, we just pray this conversation tonight would be very helpful, first for me, but uh, quite possibly uh, for others in our church. Thank you for our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we'd like to say hello. On behalf of my friend Eric and I, we'd like to welcome you, obviously, to CCV. We want to welcome those of you who are joining online wherever you're watching. That video says it all. Last spring... Um, I thought I did a pretty good job and I just didn't, I blew it. I'd like to apologize to those of you who are in our church family, who are black, whether you're watching remotely or here in person. And so we just began talking about, hey, let's, let's, let's take another run at this. And that's what this is today, that an opportunity for us to initiate a constructive conversation about the issue of race both in America 
and in our, our actual church. So, Yeah, this is such an important time for the church, the capital C church all across America, but especially here at CCV in this particular community. You know, I remember last year in 2020, um, so many of our uh, black brothers and sisters who are part of this community here and call CCV their home, they reached out to me and they were generally curious and, and were wondering how we would approach this topic as the body of Christ, as brothers and sisters. Um, this is the conversation now. So, so, so we had the four come to my house. Yes. You were one of them. And I want to thank our arts ministry, Brett and Mike and all the volunteers that made that happen. They came and shot this conversation so that I, it was for me. It truly was for me to listen and to learn and to hear that. Yeah, um, one of the first things you asked us was to go back to that time last year to those you invited over to dinner and think about well, how we were processing uh, Amada Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and some of the others at that time. So that's the first clip, clip we wanna roll. But before we do that, I wanna just, everyone, everyone in the building, even if you're watching at home, I want you to take a collective breath with me, all right? Take a deep breath. Yes, let's go. Okay. In and release. <sighs> this is nuanced conversation that we're about to have. I understand that. And we're, not, we're, we're, and we're not throwing softballs at each other. No. Yeah. But here we go. Let's roll that first clip. Shock. All dismay. But not, I wasn't completely surprised. I knew that something would get there. I knew that something would get to that breaking point. It just happened to be George Floyd when mm -hmm. that was kind of like, I, I can't even believe it. I don't feel safe in my own country. Hmm. I felt tired when I, when I saw, when I watched that video of George Floyd, you know, growing up from a family. For those of you who don't know, I, I grew up um, in a home where we talked a lot about race and what it means to be a black person in this country. So I'm seeing George Floyd and the first thing I'm thinking about is, let's rewind to Emmett Till, the original George Floyd. I'm thinking about how many more stories, how many more times do we have to see a black person being you know, unjustly um, killed like that? So just, you get shut up. You see it over and over and over and over again and you become numb to it. Um, yeah, the, the, the <laughs> and when we're stuck in our homes like that through COVID and like it's on every channel, mm -hmm. it does something to your mental health. It does mm -hmm. something to you spiritually, uh, psychologically. So yeah, tired. Yeah. tired. I was tired. I was not um, surprised by any of it. Yes. Um, it is painful, especially when you're watching another person take their last breath. You weren't surprised at what? I wasn't surprised that this was happening. Right. None of it surprised right. me. Yes. It's been right. happening for years. It's just right. not always televised. Exactly. But, um, right. but we all know it goes on. It's been going on since slave days. Yes. Um, the inception of this country, let's be honest. Exactly. You know? So, But I also felt a sense of helplessness because I never thought that any of the perpetrators would ever be held accountable because that's also something that's been going, going on for years. years. Forever. So yes. it's just like, okay, now it's on TV, but that doesn't, otherwise it's not different. It's business as usual in the United States. So you said, you made this comment to Stephanie. And I really took it to heart because I went back and did some more research. You said, let's be honest, like, so the, the issue of racism is going on from the inception of our country. You know, what, what I didn't realize and what was not taught to me, both in high school and college and graduate school, they were always small little chapters, was the extent that the church was complicit in slavery and racism from the founding of, of this continent. Like, I didn't realize that the day that Christopher Columbus, this Italian business merchant and a speculator that got funding from Spain, came to open up a trade route, the moment he landed in the Americas, he looked at the, the, the native people and noticed that they were timid and fearful and wrote in his journal, quote, they should be good slaves. 
That right there had to communicate the intent of what was going to happen. And it, like, that opened up the Atlantic slave trade from 1525 to 1866. 12.5 million people were kidnapped from their homes, and then 1.8 of them died coming across and were thrown over ship. Even at, even if the, even at the founding of our colony in Virginia, right? So I wrote this down in, 16, in 1667, the Virginia General Assembly, composed entirely of Anglican churchmen, wrestled with this idea that they wanted to evangelize their slaves, but they didn't want to lose their free labor. So they passed a resolution, and it said, quote, it is enacted and declared by the Grand Assembly and the authority thereof that the conferring of baptism does not alter the condition of the person as to his or her bondage of freedom. In other words, yeah, you can share the gospel with your friends, but that doesn't mean that they automatically don't become brothers in Christ and, and you, they don't have to become slaves anymore. All the way through our, church, our church's history in America, there was always a vocal minority, but by and large, wholesale denominations supported slavery. When, we, when, when Christians look back on American history, in Christian American history, they always look to Jonathan Edwards as being one of the greatest pastors and America's greatest theologian. But no one talks about that Jonathan Edwards, the sinner in the hand of the angry God, you remember him from English lit class in high school? No one ever talks about how he owned a young teenager named Venus, a boy named Titus, a woman named Leah, and several other adults. Let's call them by their names. Even though there was always a small minority, the church was primarily on the wrong side of history, and I don't want that to be us today. Our church, and I don't want to be that, to be that pastor. I don't want Christians 300 years from now to look back on this moment and look at us and say, why didn't they say anything? Why didn't they do If anything? I can interject here, yes. Slavery did happen, but let's let's fast forward here. Slavery is now illegal, right? Yes. And and I heard the that. civil yeah. rights movement. Yeah. <laughs> if you didn't get the memo, yeah. right? So the civil rights movement did happen, and awesome legislation has passed that now there is equal treatment under the law. But let, let's talk about how this affects us today. We are still wrestling with racism today, and it looks it might look a little different, right? It happens systemically, and what does that mean? That the, there are there are still laws in place in certain states and certain spaces that um, have racial bias, that have racial treatment literally baked into the fabric of our country. And what we have to understand here is that these are our son we are all brothers and sisters. We are all children of God. This starts with before our political positions and stuff like that. We are when you're a Christian, you're called to be a Christian first. Democrat or Republican, second. So how are we loving each other within the body? So, like, the, the people that we're seeing on TV, we don't know these people, but we know you. We're very good friends. How have you experienced racism? Or have you not experienced racism? Like yeah, that's probably the better question. Um, I mean, all my life, I can remember being no more than maybe a, just starting my high school career. I grew up in, uh, outside of Boyertown, Pennsylvania coming out of music class, just minding my own business with my friends, you know, going to my next class. And um, people, someone drove down the road, yelled out the N-word. Like, that's just normal here in this country, in some spaces. And that was normal for you? It was normal. I can still go to King of Prussia Mall to this very day. <laughs> and sometimes be followed in the store, you know? Change their tune when I go over there to check out. But, <laughs> but this, this is a part of just what's baked into our country. Like I, 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 we invited um, a person, I'm not gonna tell you if it was a woman or a man, young, old, age, whatever, but this person didn't wanna be a part of this video and this conversation because this person felt that they would lose business. 
That says it all right there. I mean, just think about that. Too af uh, afraid, right? To, to have the hard conversation. But as the body of Christ, what are we called to do? Yeah. And, and not only in this, in this country is, is it like baked into laws that still need to be overturned, but have, if, you, if you've read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, that we have a tendency, we make instantaneous judgments about people, like scientifically in the base of our brains is the amygdala and the amygdala stores images and memories. And, and, and the reason is, is it will moderate the fight or flight syndrome. Like when do we engage a situation where we need to flee it or we need to fight? And so we have these stored images of people and situations that have baked in bias to that. And so when we're in a store or we're walking down a street or like it's a big conversation now in HR and hiring people, how do you actually keep your biases, your implicit biases from, from affecting that conversation? Um, one of the most powerful moments of this conversation was when I asked Stephanie to read what I consider easily one of the best spiritual writings in the United States, um, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Take a look at this. So uh, 1963, uh, King is jailed, Birmingham jail. Mm -hmm. Writes a letter from a Birmingham jail. I consider it one of the finest peaches, pieces of spiritual writing in American history. Eight um, Southern white religious leaders spoke out and they were saying, we agree with what you're trying to do. We believe in equality, we believe in all of that. But we just, we just disagree with the approach that you're taking. So I want you to read this. <clears throat> this is a piece of it. I'm not wearing my glasses. Oh, you don't? <laughs> Oh, wait, it's kind of big. It's kind of big. There we are. <laughs> you made it big. Oh, gotta say it loud. I'm styling. I'm styling. They work. <laughs> I love baby. That. <laughs> While confined here in Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in this stride toward freedom is not the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who was more devoted to order than to justice who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in your goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of good will is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. So the night before when I was reading that, I think I had read that in graduate school and all of his writings and stuff. I had like this Jesus moment. I realized, hold on here. I'm the white moderate. Like, I remember talking with Lisa. We watched the eight-minute video of George Floyd. And I'm like, well, if he just had, did, if he didn't resist arrest at minute one, he wouldn't have died at minute eight. And, like, she's like, there's way more to that. First of all, they had terrible de-escalation de skills. But th there's more. What is it about his experience, not just him, but his parents and his grandparents and his great-grandparents that white moderates like me have stood by and like, yeah, you know, and I had to repent of that. 
I had to repent of the fact that I had theories about George Floyd and, and Ahmaud Arbery and all of that, but not one time did I call you and say, brother, how are you doing during that time? Like we talked about how we could talk about this in a church, but you as a person, how many people of color that are you friends with that during that time, March, April, and May, did you had a conversation? Like, I was that. And so one of the things that made it really painful for me and difficult for me is I'm a pastor. I know what the Bible says, and I still didn't do it. Like, uh, I, I, I printed out some scriptures. I'm gonna read one, he's gonna read one, I'm gonna read one. But I want you to look at this as it pertains to people of color. I know I have like a little Kentucky, a little color. I, I, did, I don't pronounce it correctly, but, but listen to this. As someone who has who is experienced bias and racism and that sort of thing, what do these scripture verses say to that? To our brothers and sisters in this church family, okay? Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Philippians 2, 4, look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of the others. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, encourage one another. James 5, 16, pray for one another. Like, I never prayed with you in 2020. What? Like, I had theories about all that, but our relationship, you know? Anyway. Galatians 6, 2. Bear each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. This, just for me to do a little teaching, um, bear each other's burdens. Uh, early, in the early years of CCV, I felt that our staff was also a moving company because every time a staff member would move, I still remember Frank Chaparino on the third floor of his apartment moving a sleeper sofa. I'm like, dude, seriously, just burn this thing. There's no way. It took like six of us to get this thing down. And that's the image that if you're going through something, it's a really heavy load for you. But then you have five or six brothers and sisters come alongside and lift it up with you and the load isn't that heavy anymore because you're bearing, you're lifting up each other's burdens. And that particularly comes into play with this last one, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one, pers if one person in the church family suffers, one, every church member suffers with them. If one, everyone is gonna suffer with them. During our discussion, uh, uh, the people that we had the conversation with shared that some of their friends, white friends, talked to them and they said some very encouraging and helpful things last year. But some didn't believe what they were going through. And so just take a look at this clip. That's a tough one. Why'd you say that stuff? Because it is so true. There are so many people. Um, you know, I had some white friends reach out to me last year, um, and they meant well. Um, but they were, you know, does it have to be this way? Do, you know, what about these protests? You know, and, and, and why, does, why do they run to begin with? You know, if everyone just follows the law, then there won't be any problems. <laughs> if they just sit there and follow all the instructions of the police officers, mm -hmm then there, there wouldn't be any of these issues. There wouldn't be these incidents. These <laughs> incidents are outright executions, yes. murders in the street. Yeah. No. They, if they committed a crime, yeah. they deserve to be taken to court yep. and convicted by right. a juror of right. their peers, not slaughtered in the streets. What infuriates me, yes, I have my Caucasian friends who also were at that time George Floyd specifically and some of the others in that time frame saying the same things like well if they just did it this way but now let's fast forward we're a year past that how many more stories have we heard where 
I mean, it, decorated men in the serv black men in yep. the service yeah, exactly. who have been yeah. stopped, not doing anything. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if we follow right. the law or, or not. not. Right. And so it's, it's about getting to a place as a country of acknowledging just what the original sin of this country is, what this is based yeah. off of. And so, like, when I hear this argument of when's the right time, mm -hmm. it, it's first you can't have you can't move forward until you acknowledge what the thing is. Right. You know what I'm saying? Good point. Yeah. And until you believe what I say, until you believe what I'm feeling is real, is true, is right, maybe you don't understand, but believe me, it is me. Yeah. It's coming from me. And you cannot tell me how I feel or how things right. turn out. Right. You cannot be my judge, my jury, my executioner. You cannot be that person. The way that you support me is by believing what I say. And point. that is what pissed me off the most. Good point. At yeah, which okay. point, Casey, I'm at, at the point where, and, and when you say believe, like who, which, is there believe, a Believe one? me when I say that I've been in followed in a store oh, for yeah, yeah, no yeah. reason. Yeah. Yeah. Believe, yeah. believe me, believe well, me saying, when I say it's, it's, that <clears throat> my son mm -hmm. has been stopped by a police officer and he was the only black kid in the car. Mm -hmm. Believe me yep. when yep. I say yeah. that these things happen for real. Yes. That it is not a lie and that it's, I'm not exaggerating. Yep. You're not that paranoid. this is my life. I'm not paranoid. Yes. Right. There's a lot of, a lot of pain, yeah. a lot of anger. Yeah. One thing you don't see is, I shared after that, that if you tailed my daughter in a store, like you didn't give my daughter service or you didn't give her a job or my wife, like I would be insufferable. Like I forget protesting peacefully. Bro, I, I mean, I would bring the roof down. Like, like. I hear you. I, I do. There would be like. I do want to. I want to turn the corner a little bit and bring it back to, to our church, our, our family here. Yes, all these things are true, and it is there are deep hurts and there are deep pains. But this church community, I want to talk about for a moment. Can we talk family talk? Is that all right, family? Is that okay? We're doing that? The good things are happening here at CCV. They are. They are. And it begins in being relationship with one another. You know, I can take, for example, I'll just take the arts ministry, for example. From the time I've walked through the doors of this church in February of 2010 till now, the beautiful melting pot that I've seen occur, not only on this stage, but in, in so many spaces of this church, and not in a spirit of tokenism, but to see men and women in leadership, no matter if they're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, young, old, whatever body type, whatever body whatever type, age, socioeconomic, doesn't matter. You know, in this next clip we're gonna show, Lisa talks about a little bit what it means to be in truly doing life together and being in groups with one another. You know, thinking about that Galatians passage that we were just speaking about before, that Brian was talking about, about bearing each other's burdens, you know, I'll be honest, there are a lot of different organizations and even churches in this country that are content to have um, the cultural celebration of what certain people will bring to the stage. But they don't necessarily want to live that out with our brothers and sisters when we are in pain. But that's not what CCV is doing here. It's about being in life together. Let's throw that clip. And I think groups is a great place. So one of the things that I said to the group leaders in my weekly communication with them last week, I said, even though our current series is coming to an end, when we do voices and we're talking about race relations, please yeah. prayerfully consider coming back together with your group for those that were only six week commitments mm -hmm. to discuss what is happening at church on Sunday. Yeah because that is where change happens. Yes. Right. Change right. happens okay. around a table like this, yes. in a yes. circle. Yes. Yes. Not, when, when we know each other, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. and yes. when we are friends, and the reason Casey had this relationship with her friend that was now, is because he had a relationship with her. Yeah. 
Right. And if she's hurting, and I, you know, I believe that if my brothers and sisters in Christ are hurting, my job, as Jesus says, yeah. is to bear one another's burdens. Yes. yes. And if yes. you are burdened by pain, if you are burdened by something in our society, my job as your sister in Christ is to be part of the healing process. Exactly. Yep. So that's what needs to happen in groups. We need to talk about all of it and we need everybody to understand that, like you said, there are going to be some wild strawberries out there who are going to be <laughs> like, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, well, it's not about you. It's about what's happening in society. It's what's exactly. happening in the yeah. world. How do we help change that so that you're not followed around in Target just because of your color? I, I can't wait to you all watch the video uh, because we haven't, we didn't have an opportunity to. There wasn't a segment small enough of of, of what Ennis was sharing because he would always share for five to seven minutes, and it was just incredibly, yeah, incredibly insightful uh, about his background and all of that. Um, but I, I just want to say that um, if, if here's here's what I want everybody to get out of this. I I want those of you who are people of color black, whether you're watching or here, you're part of our family. I want you to know that, that we believe you, we hear you as equal co-bearers of the image of God, that we want to be a true, real community that doesn't gloss over issues. Like I have great friends in our church that I have tremendous respect for that are cops and and I just remember a friend of mine who is who was at the protest in Bridgeport and and I said well what was your experience and I'm thinking he was going to share ah oh, it was not good and this and this and he was like I love the protesters the protesters to me were incredibly thoughtful and thankful they came up to me and and encouraging and so what we are fed as a church is this narrative from the media where clickbait that gets stories is that there is four people or 10 people, however many, that there's this burning fire behind them. Do we want to be judged as Eagles fans on the five idiots that were turning over cars after we won the Super Bowl? No. Well, maybe that actually describes all of us as Eagle fan, but yeah, but you know, we don't want to be judged by that. And so what we want to do is get beyond clickbait to get beyond news cycles and actually have conversations with each other about these things and not just form opinions in the absence of one another. So I think that what Jesus is calling us to do as a community is to get to know each other that Jesus doesn't talk about rec racial reconciliation a lot, but what he talks a lot about is having dinner together. He, he's calling us to listen to one another, to drop our, our posturing and arguments and listen and acknowledge each other's stories. And at times, if we need to, to repent, to ask for forgiveness for where we've fallen short and to offer forgiveness where people have fallen short. And so here, the way I think about this conversation is the way I think about the troops. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican. We support the troops, don't we? We are thankful for people's sacrifice in this country, regardless of political affiliation. And as disciples of Jesus, regardless of political affiliation, we are called to love one, love one another and bear each other's burdens, period. Regardless of narratives, regardless of the popular culture, regardless of the news and politics, as disciples of Jesus, the one thing we can agree on is that if a brother and sister is hurting, we're called to bear that person's burden. So there are, there are some ways we wanna invite everybody to come into this conversation, that we don't want it to just end with us. The first is this, we want you to watch this conversation Tuesday night, seven o'clock. It's going to live stream on Facebook and YouTube and then our own church channel, whatever that is. What is that? CCVlive.com. Okay. Or watch oh, yeah. CCVlive.com. Watch CCVlive.com, something like that. <laughs> but it's going to stream. And then after it streams, it'll be up there 
at any time where you can pull it up and you can watch it. Secondly, not only watch it, but then discuss what has happened, what we've been talking about today here from the platform, and then also discuss in your small groups and your family dynamic um, the video that is aired on Tuesday evening. I challenge all of us, if we have small groups or we have dynamics where we, there's someone, there isn't someone that is a person of color in that conversation, that you would invite someone to join into that dialogue so that you can begin exchange, having this beautiful exchange and understanding that goes a little bit deeper. Yeah, so I'm gonna do that on Wednesday with my men's group. And we're, we're gonna do that. Um, I wanna encourage you to be here next Sunday. I've invited a friend of mine, his name is Sean Palmer. He's a nationally recognized author and speaker. Um, he's he pretty is, cool. Oh, he is. He's cool. <laughs> way cooler than me. Uh, way, way cooler. You're going to ask him to be your pastor. He <laughs> um, he's not going to be up here with pasty wet legs and stuff. He is fantastic and funny. Um, he is a pastor in Houston, Texas, and he's black, and his wife is white. And he just has this unique perspective that without feeling judged or anything, to be able to help facilitate these conversations. And it's gonna be really encouraging and beneficial. And so just make sure you're here and you can invite some friends. But the fourth thing is, for those of you who like to read, uh, there's a book. Can you put that book image up there? Um, we have uh, books for sale out in the lobby. And for those of you who are watching right now online, I just want you to take your phones out and snap a picture of this book. Latasha Morrison. One of the funniest speakers I've heard in a long time. Love Latasha Morrison. We're trying to get her, but she's like booked four years out, right? <laughs> and she wrote a book called Be the Bridge. And it's about how we together can be a church where we bear one another's burdens. And, and it applies directly to this issue of race and for black and white. But it also applies for those of you who are wondering, how do I fit into this? If you're coming from a Hispanic background, an Asian background, which is a huge issue right now in our culture, um, that this is gonna be a very, very good book. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we want you to buy one and they're at a discounted price. If you're going through a tough financial stress, just walk up and say, I would like one of the complimentary copies that Brian talked about and just take it. We want everybody to be able to engage in this conversation. So either buy this book or um, get it online this week. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna read it during June and July, and then we're gonna come back at the last Sunday in July, seven o'clock here, we're gonna have a book talk where we're gonna talk about the book and break up into groups. It's just gonna be a, a very, very helpful time. I'm excited for it. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited for it. Last thing, we, in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, there are these things called laments. There are Psalms of lament. And they're meant to be things that the church would read together. And what they are, they're psalms where, as there, it's a statement where we together as a church, with this conversation, we're going to acknowledge certain things and we're at, going to ask for, for God's help. And so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna ask you to assume a posture of prayer. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read something and then it's gonna say church, Oh Lord, we confess our sin. And we confess together, the two of us, as well as everybody here and those of you who are watching online. So I'm gonna read this and then everyone together is going to say the church's part. And what we're hoping is that this is a confession of sorts. And for those of you who come from liturgical church backgrounds, you're like, finally, finally you're doing something. responsive reading. Right? Yeah. yeah. For those of you who come from like Baptist, you're like, what is this? What's a responsive reading? So here it is. Let's go ahead and let's do this. Let's assume a posture of prayer and ask for God to help us. So, Lord, we have fallen. With one voice and in humility, we acknowledge that we sat by while, while image bearers, talking about the image of God, while image bearers were dehumanized. We acknowledge that silence is complicity and that your word requires us to do more. We acknowledge that we have valued property over people and greed over grace. We have protected material objects while image bearers have had their lives taken, property stolen, and dignity rejected. The Bible tells us Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, 
but the one who confesses and renounce them finds mercy. So as a church, we say, O oh Lord, we confess our sin. Father, we confess our sins to you. We confess that we have unknowingly and knowingly turned a blind eye to the plight of our neighbor. We confess that we have sought out personal comfort instead of justice for all. We confess that we have sought power over peace. We confess that we have let pride get in the way of progress. We confess that we have sought revenge instead of reconciliation. We humbly ask that you forgive us of our sins and give us hearts that speak your kingdom principles at all times, even in the face of discomfort and opposition. As one church, we say, O oh Lord, we are humbled. Lord, where we were silent on issues of injustice, we now commit to speaking up boldly for biblical justice in our land. And as a church, we say, O oh Lord, give us courage. Lord, we understand that love covers a multitude of sins. We know that we cannot continue to hold the sins of the past over the heads of our brothers and sisters as they move forward in the pursuit of justice and righteousness. As a church, we say, O oh Lord, we forgive. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father, we, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the diversity that's represented in our church family. We thank you for the diversity of their experiences, the diversity of skin color, the diversity of um, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. It makes us better. You allow us here on earth to be a reflection on earth as it is in heaven, to experience worship and community on earth as it is in heaven. And so God, let justice be on earth as, in, as it is in heaven. Let love be on earth as it is in heaven. Let grace be on earth as it is in heaven. Let forgiveness be on earth as it is in heaven. Let us bear one and our, bear each other's burdens on earth as it is in heaven. Let this reflection, this small reflection of the body of Christ worldwide. Let us be as disciples of Jesus, a community that picks up our cross and loves one another deeply from the heart. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.